Good evening, everyone. I'm David Kahn, Executive Director of the Adirondack Experience. I'd like to thank you for joining us for this evening's Artist and Inspiration Program. Let me begin by acknowledging that the Adirondack Experience is situated on the Aboriginal territories of the Mohawk and Abenaki communities. Indigenous people continue to live in this region and practice their teachings and life ways. In just 45 days, count them 45, on July 1, we will open our new permanent exhibit, Artists and Inspiration in the Wild. There are going to be over 200 fabulous Adirondack paintings and other items in the exhibit, including the Harold Weston from 1922 that you see behind me. You're really going to love this exhibit. Take my word for it. Tonight, we bring you the last of our monthly Artists and Inspiration Zoom programs. For our final program in the series, we are going to take you into the exhibit galleries themselves, where in just a few weeks, many of the artists and themes that we've explored over the past two years will be on view <clears throat> for you to investigate on your own. During this evening's program, you will meet a number of members of the ADKX team that has been working on the exhibit. They include PJ Proust, our facilities manager, and Cheryl Brownstein, our director of interpretation, who will show you what's to come in the galleries. You will hear a message from Sarah Lewin, our director of institutional advancement, and we'll wrap up the program inside our new ADKX Art Lab with Michaela Hall, our program's manager. Throughout this evening's presentation, please feel free to submit any questions to the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. PJ, Cheryl, and Michaela will address your questions after the tour through the galleries. PJ and Cheryl, take it away. Welcome to the Artist and Inspiration in the Wild exhibition. I'm PJ Proust with the Adirondack Experience. I'm the Facilities Manager. And I'm Cheryl Bronstein. I'm the Director of Interpretation here at the Adirondack Experience. We have been working on this exhibition for more than five years. We started with our collection. This piece, the collection had never been seen altogether and it did not have a permanent home here in our campus. We wanted to think about what we wanted to include, what were the most important works that we wanted to make sure that our visitors saw. We wanted to think about how the exhibition would be organized. What would visitors be most curious about? What did they want to know? And of course, over these last five years, we had to raise money. Here in this light gallery, here, here in this first gallery, you're introduced to the themes of the exhibition. When you first walk in, you're going to look up and there's a 15 minute media piece created from all the works of art that we have in the exhibit. Here you'll see the chief curator, Laura Rice, reviewing the video in the studio of our media consultant team. More than 250 objects, ranging from um, fine art to small toys and utilitarian objects, can be found in these galleries. This exhibit is truly unique. While not everything is made by an Adirondacker, everything was inspired by the landscape here. The light, the forest, water, mountains. Here are some of the objects you can see in, the, in this intro gallery. You'll see a model of a Concord coach by toy maker and model maker, Benny Arnold. We have a 19th century beaded bag from an anonymous indigenous maker. We have Susan Hoffer's painting of Dana Fast from the Warsaw Ghetto to Lake Clear, a powerful image that really captures the essence of light. In the back wall, you'll see Willard Hamner's guide boat. We have one of our first Tates in the exhibition in this gallery going out deer hunting. We have furniture as well, including Tim Fortune, who's most known for his paintings, but who took the Adirondack chair and gave it a new approach through his work Metamorphosis, and the beautiful um, basket by Tian White, the titled Teal Obsession. Now, let's head to the first of our themed galleries, Light. This is the Light Gallery the first of our themed exhibition areas. Here, you can see how different artists use light as a metaphor for the world in, in, that they were living in. 
or were inspired by the way that light reflects in a lake, dapples through a forest canopy, or how the makers responded to the very light that they were seeing, creating lanterns to help them in the darker, um, to help them in the dark, works of glass, photographs. Some of the works that you'll see in this exhibition area include Cascade Sunset by Paul Matthews, Dale Nichols' Lake Saranac. We have a lot of works of photographers such as Stoddard's, Colonel, Mal Colonel McAlpin and, and Guide. We have Suzanne Porter's untitled work fo focused on Lake Placid and a Redford glass pitcher. Photographers came to the Adirondacks soon after early painters arrived in the region. Their works capture a moment of time and also serve as a more literal document, preserving, albeit through their vision, what they saw. For, any, for many artists, especially Seneca Ray Stoddard, they also saw that the region needed to be protected, an affirmation that many of today's photographers such as Henry Fair, whose works are currently on exhibit in the Woods and Waters exhibition, still speak to today. Here, you can see Seneca Ray Stoddard's A Sable Chasm, capturing how he saw the Adirondacks of his time. One of the features of this exhibition that makes it different from other exhibits focused on art is our use of the first person. For all of the living artists whose works are featured in the exhibition, we ask them to share their own thoughts about their works with you. For instance, Akwesasne artist Margaret Jacob says, her jewelry explores the natural world through surface texture and color, changing metal to materials more frequently associated with indigenous work, such as antler, leather, and horn. She creates conversations about materiality, duality, and her Akwesasne culture. Here, you can see one of Margaret Jacobs' bracelets that's featured in the exhibition. We want our visitors to get a chance to play with light and think about how the artists use color and shadow, how they think about the different seasons, time of day, and weather, and how the changes, this changes the way that their work, they work. This is the Shadow Play Interactive. How do artists change the time of day and make a scene look brighter and more daunting? The, here, here is the Play with Light Interactive. How do artists create color by blending two colors together or create texture? This is the Lighting the Landscape Interactive. It allows visitors to change the time of day, season, or weather to see how it makes the landscape look different. There's something in the ex exhibition for everyone. Let's check out what's in the next forest gallery. Now we're in the forest gallery. This is the biggest gallery in the exhibition. Everything in here, the pattern on the floor, the colors on the walls and ceilings is meant to hit at the, hint at the forest environment. The museum's vast collections of landscape pa paintings have captured how artists over the last couple of centuries have been inspired by Adirondack forests. The forest has been also a source of materials from which makers have fashioned anything from toys to iconic Adirondack rustic furniture. In this gallery, you'll see works such as The Quilt, After the Microburst, by artist Edith Mitchell. You'll see a whole collection of Edna West Teal's works, including her painting Feeding Chickens, Diana Cubitt's Vase, and Courtney Brandreth's Old Rube. We have a whole section devoted to Adirondack rustic furniture. Here, you can see pieces by Ernest Stowe, Seth Pierce, contemporary makers like Jonathan Swartout and Joe Henderson. Along with all the furniture are examples of camp decor, from more fine paintings to fungus art, baskets by indigenous makers, and a lamp by artist Barney Bellinger. 
In addition to the words of artists that you can see throughout the galleries, we also have several short videos that give you a peek into an artist process, how, the, how they work, where they work, and their connection to the landscape. Here, you can see Akwasasni Mohawk master basket maker, Sheila Ransom. My name is Sheila Ganeessa Ransom. My Mohawk name means extravagant. It wasn't until I started making baskets that someone said to me, that's why your name is Ganayeso, because your baskets are so extravagant. Because sometimes when I'll make a basket, I get carried away and I keep putting designs in it. See, this is the, the it's gonna be the feet of the basket. Then I put a braid of sweet grass in here around the top of the basket. You'll always smell that. I have people that will come into my house and say, oh my God, it smells just like my grandma's house. Because of the splint, you can smell the wood. You can smell the sweet grass. People come up with their own designs, and which is nice. But it's hard to keep it your own because people will use it. You know, it's all about sharing. Someone contacted me years ago and said, I have your grandmother's baskets. And she gave them to me. And it was unbelievable to hold them, knowing her hands made them. It was so emotional. And I look at them and I look at them and I'm like, I can make, ba I make baskets just like my grandmother. I guess I start with the strawberry. They're a sacred tool to Mohawk people. The creator made them. They're for healing. Uh, they're the first fruit of the season, the strawberry. Then, of course, the Pope basket that was given to Pope Benedict in Rome in October of 2012 as a gift from the Mohawk people. In the past, they made baskets because they had to. They had to use them for their uh, house. They used them to sell just to, to survive. Today, we make baskets to show people we're still here. We want the exhibit to be for families. Hidden in all the galleries are small objects called peekaboos. We hope all the young visitors have fun trying to find them all. Can you find the dog or the snowshoes? In forests, we also invite visitors to feel the art and the Adirondack forests the way the artists might have encountered them. There are art tools and canvases that visitors can touch, plus beadwork, bark, and other material that you can be that can be used in the art around you. One of our most beloved artists is Edna West Teal. She was known for telling stories through her art and capturing everyday life. We invite everyone to explore who, her world through this interactive. Father had a big, rough stone arch built way up at the foot of the South Mountain near the Maples. A chimney at one end, open at the other, with a good-sized wood pile alongside. There were holes on top for two generously sized iron kettles. A good sugar harvest depends on the weather, freezing nights and sunny days. Like so many farm crops on which Lady Luck must smile, if she turns a dour, cloudy face, well, maybe next year will be better. How do artists piece together their works? What do they place in the foreground? What's off to the side? We invite you to think about it, and if you want, share your composition. One of my favorite places to be at any time of year, out on the lake or in the snow, 
Let's go check out water. In the forest gallery, you had a chance to touch materials and tools that artists use. Here, we want to give you a chance to see what an artwork might feel like if you could put your hands on it. We've taken Tate fishing through the ice and we've created a three-dimensional model of it. It gives you a chance to, check, to touch the man's coat, hat, boots. You can feel the pile of wood and the, pack ba and the basket nearby. If you're lucky, you might also see the lure that's hiding just below the ice. Welcome to the Water Gallery. Water is one of the ways that artists best depicted the Adirondack environment. From the deepest and darkest days of winter, think about Tate's fishing through the ice, to a favorite pastime of standing in the middle of a stream. Take a look at John Doig's self-portrait taken standing in a stream, or Levi Wells' Prentice painting near Saranac Lake, Adirondacks. Your mind can imagine the fun of the Saranac Lake Winter Carnival or the joys of a snowshoe outing. This pair, made by Carl Heilman, who made snowshoes long before he became known for his photographs. And the Saranac Lake Winter Carnival button by artist and famous cartoonist Gary Trudeau. Welcome to the Mountain Gallery. The way that artists connect to the landscape, the mountains to the land, reflects the complex connections people have with the environment. Some painters capture the Adirondacks as an ideal wilderness but one that was devoid of the people that were already living here. Others wanted to preserve the notion of a wilderness that was still pristine, though that was also not the way it was at that time. Many of the artists in this gallery have addressed these challenges overtly and directly. Here, you can see an interpretation of an Adirondack chair by Barry Lobdell, his green revenge. We have two pieces by Natasha Smoke Santiago. Here is her work, Stolen Broken Connections, that speaks to the loss of life at the residential boarding schools. And Ray Jenkins, talking about the Tahaz mine demolition. While these artists speak to the way that people and the land interact, you can also get a close-up look at the artistic process itself. How did artists make their colors? What kind of a journey did they themselves have to go through? You'll see paint palettes by Ardo Monaco and AF Tate. And you can see an easel used by Lottie Tuttle. We want you to get a sense of the journey that many of the artists undertook. You could try your hand at fitting everything you need into a packed basket. What would you have left behind and how heavy was the basket once it was fully loaded? With an adult and kids basket weighed down, pick one up and think about where you'd want to haul this for a few days or a few weeks. Here's our team looking at this interactive. Another thing these artists thought about is scale. How do you make something as big as the Adirondacks feel so big when capturing in a painting or a photograph? You can look through a viewfinder to see a detail of the work. Is it showing a small hill or something much grander? As you move the wheel, the full painting comes into view. Next, we'll show you our makerspace. 
But first, I want to introduce Sarah Lewin, our Director of Institutional Advancement and Membership. Hi, I'm Sarah Lewin, Director of Institutional Advancement. I just want to say thank you to all the individuals, families, foundations, and corporations that helped us create Artists and Inspiration in the Wild. We can't wait to show it to you. And as a special bonus, we're having a sneak peek for members on Saturday, July 1st from 9 to 11 with a breakfast reception. So if you haven't joined or renewed, please do so today and join us. We can't wait to show it to you. Thank you. And now I'm gonna hand it over to Michaela Hall, Public Programs Manager. Michaela, you're still muted. Sorry about that, folks. <laughs> uh, I'm Michaela Hall, the Public Programs Manager at the Museum, and I can't wait for you to see our ADKX Art Lab, our makerspace. If you have visited the museum before, you know we like our visitors to be actively involved and participate in as many ways as possible. And we're going to be continuing that tradition in this space because this space is just for you. Um, we've been working with Barney Ballinger, an Adirondack artist, and he's really inspired this space. And Barney is a multifaceted artist. He's a painter, a rustic furniture maker, and a an, um, sculptor. And he uh, repurposes and recycles a lot of vintage materials in his work. Uh, once the art lab opens, we're hoping that uh, it will look a little bit like Barney's studios, although we won't be able to quite match his, his aesthetic. Um, but we would like to show you a few images of Barney Studios to see our inspiration for this space. So this uh, was a photo of Barney's metal shop and these are his uh, painting studios. Thank you. As you can see, Barney's studio and metal shop are just chock full of really interesting objects and materials that he uses to create his art. And we've been working with Barney and with Richard Lewis Media Group to create some short animated videos where Barney is talking about his own artistic process. And we'd like to preview one of those for you now. I had a great collection. I actually had 25 of these vintage lake trout rods and reels together uh, that I had gathered over the last 20 years. They fascinated me by their form and just their own little mini architectural look. And I just would start to use these as an architect would build a structure uh, with support beams or whatever, only I'm doing it with decorative pieces of fishing memorabilia. A lot of times I don't, I don't do sketches because I work right in my mind. I, I don't know how I'm able to do that. I ask myself sometimes, but I, I can form, I can think about this and look at these couple of parts and then form a visual in my mind. I don't do a scale drawing or anything in this type of thing. I just, I, I know a feel and I'll start to juxtapose pieces one against another. This is the structure of the fixture. And then I can embellish it with the smaller parts in the hand blown glass. So we'll have three of those short videos just outside the art lab so you can discover more about Barney's works and the different materials he uses to create his pieces. Um, and Barney will be joining us on Saturday, July 1st for our grand opening, as well as a number of other artists who will be working on the campus that day to celebrate the new exhibition. So inside the art uh, lab is a place for visitors to drop in and make something of their own. We will have a wonderful and talented staff who will be working in the space. 
uh, to help you get started on the project. Or if you'd rather work on your own, we'll have materials available, including some art kits, which will have materials and instructions uh, to help people get started and explore on their own. Um, the art lab will be a creative space for visitors of all ages. So we're hoping that families, adults, seniors, everyone will stop by and make some art with us this year. In addition to all these daily activities, we'll be offering 30 workshops this year. So we'll uh, have painting workshops, but also um, some craft related workshops, taxidermy, uh, sewing, and some needle felting as well. So we're really excited to offer a wide variety of workshops this year. Um, so you can extend, uh, sign up for an extended and guided art making experience. Uh, we're in the process of loading those onto our website, so we encourage you to check that in a week or so uh, to see what we have in store and to sign up, and it will be under the events tab on the www.vidkx.org website. Uh, we'll also be sharing that information in an e emails in our member newslet uh, newsletter. Sorry about that. So the Art Lab is going to be a really fun uh, space to express your creativity and to share what inspires you uh, through different art, make, art making activities. And we really can't wait for you to come and join us this summer. And now I'd like to ask PJ and Cheryl to join me uh, and we'll see if we can answer any questions you might have about artists and inspiration in the wild. Hello again, everybody. We hope you enjoyed this tour. Oh. <laughs> and then we had a, one question that came in earlier about why is glass in this art exhibition? So one of the big characteristics of glass is its translucency. And a lot of creative makers are using glass as a way to capture light. Um, so we actually have the piece that you just saw um, in Barney Bellinger's video. The um, real lamp that he made is one of the works. Obviously that has some glass in it. So it is a very important part of what a lot of makers up here are using. And the Redford glass, is, it's really, um, it's endemic in this region. It is incredibly unique and have this beautiful green. I think the formula for making it is actually still secret. Let's see. And then it doesn't look like we have um, a question related to a and I, but we do have one about our collections or exhibits in general. Uh, so how many U.S. presidents have visited, stayed, et cetera, in the Adirondacks, and do you have any exhibits depicting such? Um, so I'm not going to be able to give you a number off the top of my head, but obviously we have Theodore Roosevelt, who, um, you know, the night ride to the presidency in 1901. Um, we also had FDR visited um, and went to Whiteface. Um, I like there's a Harding story too. Isn't there's it? a Harding story, <laughs> yes. Um, uh, staying out at White Pine Camp. So there have been a number of, uh, I believe Obama came up and did some fishing um, and, and Clinton has been here as well. Uh, so there are quite a few uh, presidents who have come to the Adirondacks. My apologies that we can't give you the, the specific number. Um, and I think probably the best thing to learn more about presidents in the United uh, in the Adirondacks uh, would be to contact our new librarian, uh, who in a month or so should be able to uh, help people if they want to do any research to come in and and see the, the archival records. That would be a great spot for that. Give her a little bit of time. She just started, she just started today, so <laughs> we need to settle her in. <laughs> So just to give everybody a little background into how all this exhibit came to being, it's actually, it is quite um, a long process. I mentioned earlier that it took over five years. Part of that, of course, is securing all the funds to create it. But this team here, as well as our chief curator, Laura Rice, um, Sarah Lewin, who you saw earlier, Tara Murphy, our director, David Kahn, all of us have been involved for years now, literally, in reviewing plans and thinking again about the content that we want to communicate. Poor Laura had to take our entire collection and pare it down to what could fit. Um, one thing about this exhibit that's really exciting is that it will be changing. So every, um, every year or two, there will actually be some objects coming off, either for conservation purposes, for loans, um, or just to bring out more for our collection. 
and we are already getting ready for year two, which is really scary since year one <laughs> hasn't quite started. Um, but it's a really long process. There's a lot of reviews. You actually saw a lot of the photos from some of our site visits. Um, and that's all taken place in the last six months. And there is a flurry of activity behind these walls. It's amazing what happened just in the last six months. Mm -hmm. Does anybody have any questions? So we do have another question, again, uh, more museum, uh, museum related rather than exhibit specific. Uh, but Sally is trying to remember when the museum first opened and is hoping we can help refresh her memory. So. Um, so that will be, uh, that would have been, I believe it was August 5th, uh, 1957, uh, that the museum first opened. Uh, and this building, I believe, was the, the building that was, was here when they first opened. So uh, it's wonderful to be reinvigorating it with our wonderful uh, fine arts and decorative arts collection. We had a question about the workshops that I saw. But oh, so maybe okay. we're reading a little bit about some of the workshops that are coming. Okay, um, so yes, uh, starting in early July, we will have uh, workshops on a pretty regular basis. Um, we'll have some paint and, uh, painting workshops, two-hour classes with uh, Patrice Jarvis Weber. She'll be doing um, small paintings that are inspired by some of the pieces that will be on display, um, one for each gallery, so water, light, forests and mountains. Uh, we will be working a lot with Adirondack Art Rise, a uh, creative art making space in Saranac Lake, and they will be doing um, some glass etching, um, making a mushroom stuffy on Mushroom Mania Day, so some sewing, um, some guided painting with them as well. Um, and then we'll have two taxidermy workshops, which I'm quite excited about. Um, so we'll be doing a taxidermy mouse uh, and also a jackalope. Um, and there is a variety of other workshops um, happening as well. And again, those will be on the website and the summer newsletter has them listed as well. And we'll also have a workshop featuring Margaret Jacobs, whose yeah. piece, whose bracelet was featured <laughs> earlier in tonight's program. So that's exciting with the workshop. Yes. Um, Anthony is wondering if any of the collection ever goes out on loan to other museums or places. Um, so yes, yes. <laughs> um, our curatorial department, uh, our chief curator, Laura Rice, and our collections manager, Doreen Alessi Holmes, uh, will work with other museums to uh, make sure they have all the requirements that we, we like we, uh, other organizations to have, um, but we do send paintings and three-dimensional uh, objects out on loan. And also bring in objects on here. Um, Sally says she's going to be joining us for the July 1st celebration, so we're delighted that you will be there. Um, and Anthony is wondering what the impetus in creating the museum was. <laughs> um, well, our founder, Harold Hope Shield, um, had a camp uh, just down the road in Blue Mountain Lake, Camp Eagle's Nest and um, had a great love for the Adirondacks. And there's, um, actually there's a little bit of history on the museum's website about the founding of this, but it started as a historical association. There was two people, Harold being one of them, that were involved in the founding of it. Um, a lot of the pieces that you'll see in this exhibition, certainly a lot of the works that we have in other parts of the museum are from Harold's own personal collection. Um, and he actually was actively involved in this museum for its first several decades. And I believe the uh, Porter engine, which we have on Marion River Ferry Pavilion, was um, critical in getting the idea of a museum started and preserving and collecting Adirondack history. Mm -hmm. I think that is all of our questions. Does anybody have any more questions? <laughs> All right. Well, thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, tonight's program, as all of the programs in the series has been recorded, um, we will be able to have it up on our website. 
um, just in just a few days. So as you can see, there's a lot of enthusiasm in this room. Um, but before July 1st, we have another opening to get through. So <laughs> the um, Adirondack Experience will open for its 2023 season next week, which sounds so shocking to say, uh, on Friday, May 26th. And we hope to see you either on the, the 26th or sometime later this season. I do wanna encourage you to think about becoming an ABKX member. As Sarah mentioned, you'll get to see the exhibition before the general public, but you also get free admission for the entire 2023 season. You get discounts on many of the workshops that Michaela mentioned and a lot of our other special events and programs. Um, and finally, as we've said, we can't bring you programs like this or any of the other events that we have coming up this year, um, continuing with a new Zoom series later on in the year without the generous support of our friends. So if you can, please think about um, supporting the museum through a donation. Um, and I think we, do we have anybody else come in? Oh, we, yeah, do. we do have a couple. Others. All right, we're gonna go ahead and we've got a little bit of time to spare. So nope. pause that, thank you for a moment. Um, so Kathy is wondering, were there pieces that didn't fit in, in the themes that you wanted to include? <laughs> um, so that actually, yes, uh, there's, there's an awful lot. Nothing went on the chopping block. We, they're all pieces that are still in the collection, but as I mentioned, we will be rotating pieces out every year. Um, and again, some pieces have to rotate out. Our paper, um, so some of the watercolors, all the photographs, some of the textiles that you see, those have to be rotated out for conservation purposes, and it also gives us a chance to um, introduce some new objects into the exhibition. So this is an evolving exhibition. It will never be the same from year after year, and we have some really exciting new acquisitions that will be featured in the exhibition beginning in 2024. So not only do you have to come this year, but you have to come back next year. Excellent. And then uh, we have another uh, question about the collection. And what kind of digital collections do you have that can be viewed on the internet? Our entire collection um, of objects and paintings is available through the adkx.org website. If you go into the research um, tab on the top of the website, you'll actually see the collection and you can search. Um, I have to say it's uh, it's not quite the same as a library search, but um, once you get playing around with keywords, um, it's really, um, it's a rabbit hole that uh, keeps going and going. <laughs> There's a lot of objects in there um, and have some fun. I suggest a good one to start with is just type in Teal, T-E-A-L-L -L for Edna West Teal, and you can see all the works that we have um, by, uh, by her in our collection. All right. Um, well, thank you again for joining us, and we wish you all a lovely uh, early summer evening. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.